Hello, I'm Alison Young. I'm a professor of public law at the University of Cambridge. And I've been asked to talk to you about the role of the judiciary in the UK constitution. What I want to focus on is what we mean by judicial activism. I want to do this for two reasons. First, because the UK judiciary has been accused of judicial activism. And second, because I want to evaluate whether these accusations are justified. I don't think they are, though I can also understand why these accusations have been made. The judiciary has played a higher profile role in the UK constitution, particularly since the establishment of the UK Supreme Court just over 20 years ago, and also against the backdrop of some recent important decisions to do with Brexit. However, I don't think that this makes them activist. In order to show this, I want to explain how there needs to be a balance of power between the courts, the government and parliament. Sir John Laws refers to this as the constitutional balance. This constitutional balance in the UK has its own checking mechanism. It relies on a system of self-restraint and respect. I'd argue that whilst not perfect, the judiciary does respect the decisions of parliament when overseeing decisions of the executive. The deeper question is whether an executive with a large political majority in Parliament demonstrates the same respect for parliamentary and legal controls. Accusations of judicial activism have been made recently with regards to two exceptional cases, the Miller decisions. The first Miller case concerned whether the government could inform the EU of the UK's intention to leave the EU treaties by using a prerogative power, that is a residual power belonging to the monarch that is now mostly exercised by the government, as opposed to a power given to the government by legislation. A majority of the Supreme Court concluded that the prerogative power to withdraw from a treaty could not be used, as to do so would change domestic law and frustrate legislation. In the second Miller case, which was also brought by Joanna Cherry MP, the Supreme Court concluded that Boris Johnson's decision to advise the Queen to prorogue, that is suspend Parliament, was unlawful. Concerns of judicial activism led the government to commission two independent reviews, one looking at judicial review and the other at the Human Rights Act 1998. Both of these independent reviews concluded that there was a good working constitutional balance with courts, for the most part, effectively holding the executive to account for its actions whilst respecting the role of parliament. This conclusion was not shared by the government. But what do accusations of judicial activism mean? We mostly hear that the judiciary is activist because it is taking political as opposed to legal decisions. Law is for the courts, politics is for Parliament. Courts should stay out of politics, leaving that form of check over the government to Parliament, in particular to ensure the government is acting for the public good as a pub determined by the will of the electorate. So why then are the courts being political in these controversial decisions? It might be argued that these decisions are political because they have large political consequences. After all, the decision in the first Miller case meant the government had to initiate new legislation, which Parliament had to approve, granting it the power to notify the EU of the UK's intention to withdraw from the EU treaties. Following their decision in the second Miller decision, the prorogation was quashed and Parliament was able to sit again. Bills going through Parliament that had lapsed were revived. These are large political ramifications, but there is nothing new in the courts taking legal decisions that have political consequences. This is what judicial review is all about, ensuring that actions of the executive are lawful. This includes actions of ministers and the prime minister, and not just actions of people like housing officers who have a duty to find homes for those they're legally bound to house, or for social security benefits, officers ensuring that social security benefits are given to those who need them. All are bound by the law, and all will face the requisite legal consequences if they act unlawfully. Another argument is that courts are taking political decisions because they are deciding the merits of the actions of governments and not merely whether they are lawful. It is the job of the executive, accountable to Parliament, to evaluate what decision is the best course of action. It is the job of the courts to ensure that this decision, regardless of the outcome, is lawful. But this is a very tricky line to draw. We can see this if we look again at the second Miller decision more closely. 
the Supreme Court concluded that the common law placed limits on the scope of the prerogative power of prorogation. These limits stem from two constitutional principles, parliamentary sovereignty and parliamentary accountability. To have exceptionally prorogued Parliament for such a long period of time, at such a difficult time in the UK's constitution history, restricted parliamentary sovereignty, which requires Parliament to be able to sit to enact legislation, and parliamentary accountability, where Parliament holds the government to account for its actions. Parliament cannot do these things if it is not sitting. The government needed to provide a justification for such an exceptional prorogation. But as the government did not provide a reason, the prorogation was unlawful. Critics, however, argue that the courts were not really using the law here. They were just assessing on the merits whether the prorogation was too long. Yet it should be for politics and not law to decide when Parliament should prorogue and for how long. Other accusations of judicial activism focus on the role of the courts in human rights cases. Are courts engaging in politics by changing words in legislation and undermining the will of Parliament in order to protect rights? These criticisms focus on Section 3 of the Human Rights Act 1998, which requires courts, so far as it is possible to do so, to read and give effect to legislation in a way that protects convention rights. One example is a case called Gaidan and God in Mendoza, where the court was asked to determine whether a widower in a same-sex partnership would be able to continue to live in the family home that had been rented by his now sadly deceased partner. Legislation allowed spouses and those living together as man and wife to continue renting the family home in these situations. The court interpreted this legislation to include same-sex couples living together as man and wife. I would argue this is an example of courts ensuring rights are protected, interpreting words in legislation to match current understandings of how they should apply. But others would say this is contradicting the clear wording of Parliament, who might not have wanted same-sex partners to continue in tenancies in this way. In order to determine whether these accusations are justified, we need to think a little bit more about why we should distinguish between law, and the prop, uh, which is the proper realm of courts, and politics, the proper realm of government held to account by Parliament. Constitutional commentators refer to this as the balance between the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty. The rule of law ensures that the government acts within the proper sphere of its legal powers. Parliamentary sovereignty recognises that in the uncodified UK constitution, legislation enacted by Parliament is the highest form of law in the land. To understand this further, we need to ask why courts are best placed to determine legal issues, whereas Parliament is best placed to regulate political issues. We can make two types of argument. First, we can ask which institution is more likely to make the right decision. Courts are experts in the law. Judges are trained in legal reasoning, interpreting case law and legislation. This reasoning process is not about asking what a judge thinks is the right outcome, but about evaluating different interpretations of the law and working out the legally correct answer. Politicians are used to balancing interests in society, their way of arguments and listen to representations from across society aiming to promote the public good and maximise public benefits. Courts and Parliament also reason in different ways. Parliament sees the big picture. It can make legislation on any topic it wishes to achieve the public good. Courts see the parties before them and their specific grievances. They can only decide cases brought to them by specific individuals. This means that courts can provide a good check on legislation where general words might achieve the public good generally, but not in a specific circumstances, or where general provisions might give a good protection of human rights overall, but nevertheless harm the rights of a particular individual when that legislation is applied to them. We also think about how these decisions are made by asking ourselves which institution is the most legitimate to take a particular decision. We trust Parliament and the government to balance interests because we recognise that often this requires choices to be made between different accounts of the public good. MPs are directly accountable to the electorate for these choices. Ministers are accountable to Parliament, which in turn is accountable to the electorate. The judiciary are not elected. 
In fact, the UK Constitution protects the independence of the judiciary. This independence means that they can decide issues arising between individuals and the state without being biased towards the interests of either one or the other. Courts can also provide a better protection of minor minority rights, particularly when they contradict the wishes of the majority. The judiciary does not need to appease a majority of voters in order to be reappointed. It is these features that help us to find a good constitutional balance. We can see this, for example, in a recent Supreme Court case, which looked at whether the limit of two children per household to receive child tax credits discriminated against children in larger families. The court recognised that Parliament and the government were best placed to determine these complex issues, balancing different claims on the public purse in times of austerity. The court also recognised how Parliament had listened to a range of public interest groups when making this choice. But the courts also recognised that it was their job to ensure this balance did not discriminate against specific minorities. In this case, the court didn't think there was any unlawful discrimination because the extent of children living in large households was not a very specific protected characteristics. But I think the court would and should have decided differently if the law had said, for example, that two ch uh, child benefits was on only available, or child tax credits were only available for male children, or if children from a particular religion received child tax credits and others did not. There, I think the court should step in and stop that type of discrimination. The UK court works when Parliament, the government and the courts respect their role in the constitution and that of other constitutional actors. Our constitution also has other ways of maintaining a good constitutional balance when this respect breaks down. Parliament can, if it wishes, enact legislation in response to decisions of the courts. Some see the first Miller case, for example, as a bit of a pyrrhic victory. The court might have required legislation, but that meant Parliament could, if it wanted, place conditions on the government's ability to leave the EU. But Parliament chose not to. So although courts ensured the lawfulness of the government's actions, it was Parliament, in the end, that had the final say on whether there should be any conditions on the UK's notification to the EU of the UK's intention to leave the EU's treaties. Courts interpret and enforce legislation. In some cases, though, the courts also use dicta. This is a kind of opinion. It's not binding, it doesn't form law, but nevertheless might guide future actors. There is some dicta that there might be some acts of parliament that the courts just would not be willing to enforce. Examples have been given of acts of parliament that would undermine the ability to have an effective voting system, or situations in which you completely remove the ability of the courts to hold the government to account for its actions through judicial review. I would argue that these dicta are not examples of judicial activism. Rather, it's an example of the courts ensuring a good constitutional balance. Judicial review and fair voting rights are essential requirements in any system that relies on parliamentary sovereignty. We can also see that it's highly unlikely that any government would be able to initiate and enact such legislation given that it's incountable to Parliament. The political checks should prevent this. What the courts are really saying here is, in an extreme circumstance, when these political checks fail or break down, then the courts would step in as a constitutional backstop to avoid such a serious constitutional crisis. Maybe the question we have to ask ourselves is not if the courts are overly activist, but why courts are being criticised for their judgments. Is this because courts are failing to respect their proper constitutional role? Or are courts, courts merely pointing out when the government is failing to respect the legal and political limits placed on the government by the UK's uncodified constitution? Well, I will stop there and leave it for you to think about this issue, which hopefully we will get a chance to discuss in um, the seminar later on. Thank you very much for listening to me.